swings. We are people of pendulum swings. And because of that, it creates tensions, tensions. And we find ourselves constantly trying to figure out how to navigate between these tensions of life. And so we are starting a brand new series today. Pastor Phil has given me the honors of kicking this one off um, called Beautiful Tensions. Beautiful Tensions. And that might seem uh, like maybe uh, an oxymoron, right? How can tensions be beautiful? Because in reality, tensions can create uh, uncomfortable situations. Tensions can create awkwardness. Tensions can create bitterness or pain, right? Trying to figure out, you know, how can I have hope in the midst of grief? Or how can I trust when I'm full of doubt? And sometimes Christianity can feel this way because following Jesus means embracing the paradox of the pendulum. And so our prayer for this series are really three things. One is enduring encouragement, right? We know that in this room right now, there are hearts that are hurting, that are in pain due to lingering, unaddressed tensions. And my prayer as your pastor um, is really that by addressing some of the tensions that we're going to address in this series, and then by applying the gospel that you will be strengthened and encouraged. Second is really this uh, formational growth, right? Because tensions really is, is like much like stretching. And, and when you stretch the body, it really helps you to become uh, more mobile. It helps uh, you uh, perform physically. Uh, it helps decrease risk of, energy, uh, of, of injury. And in learning to live within these beautiful tensions, hopefully will stretch you and help you to grow in Christ. And then finally is this sort of displayed wisdom, right? By speaking into these tensions, we're hoping that what you will do is both the believers and the, and the unbelievers as you face these tensions, our prayer is that the wisdom of God would be on display and that it would be a type of wisdom that the world cannot give, but one that comes from Jesus Christ. And so let's pray really quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord God, for this series that we are embarking on. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we learn to live within various tensions, Lord God, that we will do so because by doing so, God, it helps us to be more like you. And that is our goal. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. When you look at how Christ loved Right? When you look at how Christ asks us to live and to love other people, there's tensions. There's tensions. And tensions can make us feel frustrated. It can make us feel anxious. And oftentimes what we try to do is we try to avoid tensions. Or we try to fix them right away. Or we try to, you know, maybe resolve them or, or maybe even act as if they don't even exist. Completely deny them, right? But the gospel calls us to embrace them, to embrace them. And, and when you look at the gospel, sometimes how you see Jesus asking us to, lo to love others, how you see Jesus asking us to live can feel messy, inconsistent, unfair, and confusing. There's a tension. And my temptation and your temptation is to resolve the tension but if you don't hear anything else, hear this today. Ready? Pay attention to the tension. Pay attention to the tension. If you try to resolve these beautiful tensions that we are going to be walking through in the next few weeks, right? If you try to resolve them, you are going to be giving up something very important. And yet, we are tempted to do that every single day, especially when it comes to today's tension of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Isn't it interesting? Grace and truth. And when we look at Jesus, 
he himself seems to really stir the pot on this topic, right? At times he seems forgiving, and at other times he holds everybody accountable. At times he seems harsh, and at other times he seems very kind. At times he points out sins, other times it's almost as if he ignores them, right? And this tension is what drove people absolutely crazy about Jesus, but we do not dare walk away from it. Today we'll actually be in the book of Exodus and the book of John. And in the book of Exodus, you have Moses. Now Moses went up to the mountain and, and there in the presence of God, he was given the Ten Commandments and he wrote them on two tablets. And, and most people probably know that. What some people may not know is that actually those tablets broke and he had to make a second copy. And that's where we find ourselves in our Exodus chapter, which is Exodus 34. And it says this, starting in verse 4. So we cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord commanded, and he took his hand to the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Gracious, goodness and truth. Gracious and truth. Grace and truth. Yeah. See, what we have here in the Old Testament is God is revealing himself to Moses and makes this proclamation that God is abounding in grace and truth. What do we mean by grace and truth? Well, here's what we mean. Truth is God's standard, while grace is God's favor. Truth is God's standard, so on this side, God's standard, and then grace is God's favor. So we have truth and we have grace. Here's the problem is most of us will go from one extreme to the other. But if you have one without the other, you actually don't have either. If you have truth but without grace, you actually don't have truth. Yeah. And if you have grace but devoid of truth, you actually don't have grace. Wow. In order for one to exist, both must exist. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some of you, maybe you grew up in churches... And maybe some of your church tradition, you found that your church tradition was on one side of this extreme. Or maybe you grew up in another church tradition and you found out that that church was on another side of this extreme. Right? Maybe some of you grew up in the church that was all truth but no grace. Right? I mean, you went to a church and the preacher told it like it was. He didn't hold any punches. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you weren't shouting amen. You were shouting ouch every two minutes. You know what I'm talking about? But, that, but you felt good. You said that's how you know that, the, that the, the spirit was really there. I mean, when you could just go in and he just tells it like it is, you know? And that's when you knew it was a really, really good service. When you walked out of there feeling a little beat up, you knew it was good. <laughs> And these churches were definitely known for what they were against more than what they were for. But people leave because it feels too legalistic and lacking compassion. On the other hand, maybe you went to a church that was all grace but no truth, right? I mean, these were the self-help, lift me up, make me feel good messages. And if you didn't leave inspired, if you didn't leave with a quote that you could tweet or put on a mug and feel good about then you're like, I don't know if the spirit was really there. You know, it's a, it's a don't tell me how to act good, just tell me how to be good type uh, of church, right? This idea of how do you feel good without having to have any kind of standard or accountability. And yet people end up leaving that church too because it feels too superficial, disingenuous. And here's why. You cannot have one without the other. In fact, let me put it another way. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in several different ways. And maybe one of these ways will resonate with you. And, 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 and each of these ways, I'm going to give you a, a, a new way to frame it. But also, I'm going to kind of tag some sort of pop culture reference to it. The first one is this. Truth without grace leads to corruption. 
Grace without truth leads to condemnation. Truth without grace leads to corruption. Grace without truth leads to condemnation. The TV show The Hands May Tell is a television series based off of a novel in a society that apparently was once part of the United States, but then this society sort of breaks off and its government imposes strict and literal interpretations of scriptural truths to justify and enforce a social order that is brutally oppressive. This is a great example of extreme truth without grace. And it ultimately brings corruption. Now, theologically speaking, it is the same thing. See, if we have a God that is all truth but devoid of grace, then what that does is that leaves humanity corrupt. However, on the other extreme, all grace without truth leads to condemnation. Because what it does is it places within us a false sense of security, right? Making us think like there's nothing wrong with humanity. Right. Humanity at its core is kind and caring and perfect, right? Yeah, that's good. Isn't that true? Right. Think of it this way. If I had a mole that looked concerning on my body and, and let's just say I took some foundation and I kept covering up and kept covering up, kept covering up because... The reality is, is that I just wanted everything to be okay. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. And while I'm telling myself that, my body, my body is riddled with cancer. You see. We need grace, but we need truth. And grace without truth means we never see the reality of our sin, the need for repentance or forgiveness, leaving us consumed by guilt, shame, and condemnation. Here's another way of putting this. Truth without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. Have you ever known somebody that is all truth but no grace, right? And usually they're brutally honest, Right? They value cold, hard facts over emotional connectivity. And this approach, even though it seems upright, it neglects the God-infused complexities of humanity and human interaction, and it makes truth a tyrant. And this sort of narrow or myopic view fails to recognize its own hypocrisy. Because on one hand, the person says, well, I'm all about truth, and yet they deny the truth about grace. And so by doing so, so they represent a Christ that is in the tabernacle turning over tables, but never a Christ that is on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But on the other extreme, grace without truth is meaningless. There's a TV show called The Good Place. I don't know if you've watched it, but um, basically what happens is Eleanor wakes up one day and she discovers that she's in heaven. She's in the good place. And she begins to freak out because she knows that her life on earth was anything but good. And she's like, okay, what am I going to do? And so throughout the show, she basically has to fake it. She has to pretend because she's worried that if she's found out that she will no longer be in the good place. Well, as the show progresses, what she soon discovers is that everybody is pretending. Everybody's faking it. Everybody's performing. And what this actually causes is her relationships with everyone to be shallow, to be disingenuous. And what's even more fascinating is as the show keeps revealing itself, the longer people are in the good place pretending and performing, the environment begins to go crazy. It begins to destruct. And actually, it turns heaven into a living hell. Wow. Valerie Forgeard, who is the global ambassador of Women in Tech Network, not a Christian, 
she wrote an article that's relevant to this topic. She was trying to answer the question of why does it seem like this generation cannot handle difficulties? Why is it that, that, that we live in a society that seems to struggle with, with suffering and pain and even seems to struggle with candid honesty? And she points to this shift of emotional intelligence. And she talks about how while this shift uh, brought about bear, uh, positive changes, some great changes, it, it also had a downside on what some call empathy overload. And in the article, she actually points to uh, three negative or dangers that happen in this sort of empathy overload culture that we find ourselves in. The first one, she says, is people-pleasing mentality, right? To, to avoid offending anybody or causing distress, individuals might go out of their way to accommodate everyone else's needs and preferences, even if ultimately it will cause harm or discomfort. The second thing she points out is emotional burnout. She says we're, that we're constantly being tuned into other people's, you know, negative emotions predominantly. And because of that, it can lead to an exhaustion and feeling overwhelmed so that even the most minor perceived slights are blown out of proportion. And then the third thing she says is this, the, this exhausting of personal insecurities that when we are constantly walking on eggshells and worried and, 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 and keeping our opinions to ourselves and not giving honest feedback and, and, and not wanting to be truth tellers. And so we hide that part of us and, and we constantly want to make sure that, hey, listen, we're just giving all grace and no truth and everything's great and everything's wonderful. We don't confront. We don't tell anybody anything. It's all great. She says what ends up happening is it's easy for self-doubt and anxiety to, fill, to flood in because then we feel like we're not measuring up. And then this is what she says. I'm just going to read you a quote from the article. She says this. This isn't to say that fostering greater emotional intelligence isn't absolutely important for maintaining healthy relationships and navigating complex social situations. But perhaps a balanced need a needs to be struck between prioritizing empathy and recognizing that it's sometimes nece necessary to set boundaries for, one wells, wells be for one's well-being. As freedom-loving people who crave authenticity in our relationship with others, we should remember, this is interesting, that true liberation, notice what she says, true liberation, in other words, true freedom, and we're supposed to be people of freedom, like we want our freedom, right? True freedom lies in finding a happy medium between empathy and resilience. In other words, the resilience to be able to, to, to share your opinion, the resilience to be able to confront somebody, the resilience to be able to be a truth bearer, right? Wow. Where we can acknowledge the feelings of others without sacrificing our own peace of mind. Interesting. Interesting. And so there's this great example of what it of what it means to be truth without grace is mean and grace without truth is meaningless but also let me give you the last one truth without grace leads to legalism while grace without truth leads to license i think one of the greatest examples of maybe a legalistic christian in pop culture would be nobody else but ned flanders from the simpsons right he's a great example of what happens when, we, when it can lead to legalism. <laughs> now, what's interesting, though, is ultimately what this does is this doesn't just create a caricature of Christianity, but it actually creates a caricature of God, a caricature of Christ himself, one that is a bloodthirsty egomaniac that is an evil task master, master demanding performance in order to be saved. See, because truth without grace leads to legalism. And so you have to do these certain things. You have to check off all the boxes. You have to dot your I's and cross your T's. And you have to make sure that you measure up. Because God is a taskmaster. 
On the other hand, if you have grace without truth, then that leads not to legalism, but to license. Meaning everybody can do what they want, right? Everything is okay. What's right and wrong can be defined and determined uh, to, up to each individual. There's no such thing as good or bad. It's relative, which means that God is not just. Right? It's almost like it's this deism worldview. Deism is this, is this idea that God kind of created the world and then sort of just left us to our own circumstances. He, he's no longer interested. He doesn't, he doesn't enter into human affairs, right? It's this idea of whatever we want it to be. And the problem is, is that if we have grace with no truth, then it makes a mockery of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the reality is, is we need both. We need both. Why? Because grace saves and truth frees. Grace saves and truth frees. See, grace saves. According to Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved. But then John 8, 32 says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Grace saves and truth frees. And I love that it's John that wrote that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Because when you begin to read the book of John, you then go from noticing this tension to noticing the revelation. From the tension to the revelation. John begins his whole book, this whole account, right, with this grand picture that, that Jesus is, is, is the word, right? And that God sent this word, Jesus, into the world and that this word became flesh, be, became human. And that Christ tabernacled or dwelt, lived among us. And John does this great job of, uh, of making us realize that it's almost as if Jesus was painting a picture and he, he painted it full of people. And then he put himself into the painting to interact with the people in the painting that he painted. But the people did not recognize him as the painter and threw him out. And in this beautiful document called the book of John, he gives us a testimony that best captures this tension, that, that best captures the tension of what it is to also be a follower of Jesus Christ. Look at this. In John 1, he says this, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. See, John tells us that he saw something, and it's almost like you had to be there to see this, and, and he gives us this beautiful language to describe the paradox. He gives us the, the, this language, that, and he says it's, that he was full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. And immediately we should feel the tension. Because truth says you're broken, but grace says you're whole. Grace says it's that, that it's going to be okay, and truth says, oh, you're going to work on it a little bit here. Grace says, no matter what you do, I love you, and truth says, yeah, but you're accountable. And John spent years watching Jesus navigate the intricacies of very difficult circumstances, and, 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 and he's saying, hey, listen, while I'm watching Jesus, this is what I saw. He was absolutely full of grace and truth all the time. Absolutely full. See, we want to push Jesus to one side or the other. We want Jesus to be all truth and no grace or all grace and no truth. Isn't it interesting? We, we like the verses that lean towards truth when we're telling other people what to do. And we like the, the verses that lean towards grace when it's about us, don't we? Right? Right? And Johnson's, I've watched him, and the best way I can describe him is that he was to the brim full of not one or the other, not 50-50, you know, not part grace, not part truth, but full of grace 
and truth. Not, not 90% truth and, and one part grace, but 100% truth and 100% grace. And then look what he says in John 1. He continues in verse 16. He says, and out of that fullness, what fullness? The fullness of grace and truth. We have all received grace in place of grace already given. You see that? In other words, John gives us the truth that we have received grace upon grace upon grace. And then, in case that's not clear enough, he goes on in verse 17 to say, For the law that was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't use the word given. You would have thought he would have used the word given there, right? That grace and truth were given through Jesus Christ. But he uses the word came through Jesus Christ. It's the same word as begotten or birthed. (laughs) And this is what Jesus did. Jesus brought full of grace and full of truth. He brought that reality, right? He brought that all to bear with every person that he met. He brought all of that to bear in every circumstance that he found himself. He was grace and truth personified. That's the revelation. Now listen, there's a lot of truth claims out there. Tons of truth claims, right? Tons of religions, tons of belief systems, a lot of truth claims. However, Christianity is the only truth claim that came dressed in grace. When you look at the Samaritan woman, here's Jesus having this conversation. And just the fact that he was having a conversation with a Samaritan woman was grace alone, right? Right? It was a scandal to see that because if you understood the dynamics between the Jewish people and the Samaritans and then you were to see Jesus talking to a Samaritan, this was a clutch my pearls moment, y'all, right? Because Jews did not talk to Samaritans. They kept their distance. They, They would walk around them. And here is Jesus having a conversation with a Samaritan woman. And they begin to talk about water. He's at a well, she's at a well, she's getting water, he's asking for water. They begin to talk about water. And then what's interesting is he then reached into the most shameful and painful part of her life. And he says, listen, why don't you go back into town and would you grab your husband for me? And she says, well, actually, uh, I don't have a husband. And he says, that's right. You had five husbands, none of them worked out, and the man you're with now, you're not even married to. Truth. He says, but I tell you what, I have water that will quench the thirsting of your soul that no man can satisfy, and it's for you, grace. (sighs) Do you see that? Why? Why? Because truth saves and grace I'm sorry, grace saves and truth frees. See? And just as Jesus was full of grace and truth, we are called to be people of grace and truth. And so there's this tension that we see, these two dynamics, and we're trying to figure out, you know, how, how in the world can we live in them? Because some of us, we want to be all truth, and, 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 and we don't mind being the, the truth bearers. We, we, we believe that, that, we are, that we are loving people when we are telling them the truth. And, and others find ourselves on the other extreme where we're like, well, we want to be all about grace, and, 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 and we want to show compassion and, and empathy, and we believe we're loving people when we are dead demonstrating grace. Let me just make sure that I'm making myself perfectly clear. When we're talking about two extremes, what we're talking about is truth without grace and a grace without truth. Truth without grace and a grace without truth. And so you look at the life of Jesus and you see him displaying this and and you can't help but say, okay, yeah, I mean, okay, that's cool, but that's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But he calls us to be people of grace and truth. He calls us to take this tension and then to understand the revelation and then to bring the application to our lives. 
point three, the application. If you're wondering, you know, well, I wonder where I am when it comes to displaying grace without truth or truth without grace. Let me just give you some adjectives here that might help you out. Let's start with grace without truth. Maybe you're avoidant, right? Avoiding conflict, even if it means not addressing important issues. Does that sound like you? How about inauthentic, right? You don't give real opinions or real feedback because you're worried. You know, you want to make sure the boss likes you or you're cool, you're cool with your coworkers, you know. Maybe you're walking on eggshells. Maybe you're people-pleasing, so you, you often prioritize preserving relationships for expressing honest opinion. Maybe you're non-confrontational. Right? You don't want to upset anybody. You don't like confrontation. You don't want to get into it. You just want there to be peace and happiness and butterflies and skittles and rainbows. Maybe you're unreflective, right? You don't want to take time to pause and really kind of look to see what's really going on inside. Maybe you prioritize harm, uh, harmony over truth. And so you may avoid give ne giving necessary criticism because you don't want to hurt people's feelings, but at the same time, you're actually hindering their growth. Individuals that help lead and minister certain departments here at the church. And, um, and there's a couple of captains that I've said this to when we were talking about, you know, how to have a difficult conversation. And, and for, for some of them, it's hard to have difficult conversations with people because they love them. They love them, and they, and they, don't, they don't want to hurt them. They don't want to hurt their feelings, and, and so they end up just not having it. Right. And what I often tell them is, well, actually, you're hurting them, not loving them, by not having the conversation. Yeah. You're hindering their growth, mm -hmm. you see. Maybe you're on the other side. You're like, well, uh, what does it look like to have truth with no grace? Well, this person usually speaks their mind with no filter, right? They're kind of, uh, I'm going to tell it like it is, and I'm going to say my piece, and I'm going to say what I think, right? But they're uncompassionate. They're unyielding. Maybe they're overly critical. They're constantly criticizing or insensitive. I'm just going to say this, and, and, and it doesn't matter how somebody feels. And for people on this side, they feel like they're being loving. They're feeling like, listen, I, I know this might hurt their feelings, but I love them too much, right? And I, I'm gonna and I'm gonna say what needs to be said. I'm gonna bring them truth. They need a wake-up call, they need a reality check, right? But they do it in a way that's insensitive, that lacks compassion. Many times they're unforgiving. Many times they're judgmental. They're, they're almost looking for people to fail. They're watching to see what they can criticize and they can critique. Some of you have walked into this room this morning wanting to critique even me as I'm speaking. Some of you are criticizing me right now in your minds as I'm giving this sermon. That's okay, right? You're waiting, you come to church waiting to do that. <laughs> you become judgmental. Ultimately, you're unapproachable. These two realities. But here's what's interesting. Jesus Christ, being full of grace and full of truth, asks you and I that we are called to double, to have a, to, a called to a double major, right? We're not called to major in one area and minor in the other. Right? We're not called to be like, well, actually, Pastor Roger, I'm actually pretty good with, I'm really good with grace, and, I, and I'm okay with truth, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not devoid of truth, but I'm, I'm okay with it, right? And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm lots of grace and a little bit of truth sprinkled in, right? Or some of you might be like, listen, you know, I, I, I tell the truth, but it's not like I'm completely empty of grace. No, no, no. Lots of truth and, you know, a few rays of grace. But Jesus Christ calls us to a double major. He does not call us to major in one and minor in the other. You're not called to be 50% grace or 50% truth, but 100% grace and 100% truth. Let's look at the book of John one more time. 
because this might be one of the greatest examples of what this tension looks like in reality. Walked out, personified, in person, in action. And so here what we have in John chapter 8, verse 3, it says this. And as Jesus was speaking, the Jewish leaders and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and placed her out in front of the staring crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Moses' law says to kill her. What do you say about it? Wow. I just want you to imagine this for a moment. All right? Someone walks in and sees this man and this woman. They're having sex. One of them's married, if not both of them. Right? Who knows? The guy probably darted off. They probably couldn't even catch him. They caught the girl. She's probably wrapped up in a sheet, threw, him in fr threw her in front of the, uh, of the crowd, and here's Jesus, and they say, Jesus, this woman was just caught in the act of adultery. The law says that, you, that we have to stone her to death. What do you say about it? What do you say about it? Now, in the context of this moment, and according to the truth of the law, she rightfully deserves an execution. That's hard to hear. That's hard to hear. Because for us, we want to root for her, don't we? Everything within us wants to root for her, don't we? Of course we do. Of course we do, right? But the reality is, is that her and the other man, that, 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 that this action that they were in, just completely destroyed someone's family, someone's marriage. She is deserving and has earned justice. And the point of John 8 is not to be like, come on, guys, let's you know, be kind to one another and let's just all be a little more kind. If we're all a little more kind, then the world would be better. If that was true, then humanity's brokenness would be fixed by now. If all it took was just a little more kindness, you see. But see, the point of the story, the crux of the story, is that you and I are the woman in this story. And, 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 and the word of God says we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin, the penalty of the sin that we've all done, that penalty is death. That's the truth. And this woman just got found out and will eventually all get found out, right? She gets caught and she's dragged there and here she is put in front of Jesus and no doubt she's been wanting to meet Jesus, but not this way. Not this way. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they have Jesus in a trap and it's a really good trap, guys. I mean, let's give them credit. This is, this is a really good trap right? And here's why. Because they say, hey, Jesus, listen, the law of Moses, right? And, and, and you're claiming to be God. So I guess the law that you wrote. And, and because you're claiming to be God, that means you're all knowing. So you saw this woman and what she was doing in advance when you wrote this law, right, God? Right? Jesus, who's claiming to be God? And, and, and so According to this, she should be executed right here, right now. What do you say? And as crazy as it sounds, they're right. They're right. But it's also crazy how you can be so right and so wrong at the same time. It's also crazy how you can know the word, but not the author of that word. And now Jesus is standing in this tension of truth and grace. And, and what is he going to do? What is he going to do? Is he going to trample on truth and uphold grace? Or, or, or is he going to go and uphold grace and, and trample on truth? Well, where is he going to stand? Is he going to stand over here? Is he going to stand over here? Where is Jesus going to be able to stand? Is he going to give sin a wink in the gun and say, here you go? Is he going to look at her and say, oh, you silly goose. What are you doing? Hard morning, right? Well, lucky for you, I'm actually the God of grace. The God of truth was in the Old Testament, but I'm Jesus, and I came to swing the pendulum to the other side. So lucky for you. Now run along. Don't do that again. 
Is that really what's happening here? Because a lot of us think that that's the story of the Bible and the point of the story. Right? But that's not what's happening here. There was an earned and deserved execution. And the only way that Jesus is going to be able to uphold grace and uphold truth for this woman is to take the execution on himself. To not just die for her, but to die instead of her. You see? So what does Jesus do? Does he stand for grace or does he stand for truth? Actually, he kneels for love. It says that he knelt in the dirt and he began to write. He began to write. And then he says a line that has become so famous that people quote it all the time and they probably don't even realize they're quoting scripture. But he says, if any of you are without sin, throw the first stone. He knelt in the dirt. And theologians have long speculated what he was writing because we don't know. One theory is that he was writing all the sins of every person that was there with the stone in their hand, right? Could be true. But see, this is important. Why? Because, because truth saves and grace frees. And so look what he says in verses, starting in verse 7. He says, he says all right. All right, fine, have it your way, but, 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 but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and he wrote in the dust. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest. Isn't that interesting? The oldest are the ones that dropped their rocks and walked away first, probably because they lived long enough to know that they are imperfect right? Until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to this woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? Don't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. See, nobody knew what he wrote, but we all know where he was. He was in the dirt. And just as he knelt in her dirt, Jesus kneels in yours, in your brokenness, in your mistakes, in your sin, in your regrets, in your shame, and says, where are your accusers? Where are they? And Jesus gives you the truth. The truth is, is that we are sinners. We are utterly guilty of our sin. We desperately need saving, and we can't save ourselves. We are guilty. comes and he gives us grace and for all of us that calls on the name of Jesus he says this I don't condemn you go and sin no more would you stand are you hurting and broken within overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself thirst for a drink from the well, Jesus is calling. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrow and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling.